Okay, um, let me go ahead and uh, get this first presentation started. So what are we going to do? I'm going to try to bring everybody up to speed and uh, get us on the same page because I think some of you might be new to Sci4. Some of you might never have even used Sci4 before. You just wanted to check it out. So we're, we welcome all of you as well as our expert programmers. Um, we're going to start things off with just a little bit about what Sci4 is and I'm going to turn it over to Professor Daniel Crawford of Virginia Tech, uh, who is a longtime uh, Sci contributor and supporter and wrote an awful lot of the code in the old Sci3. So Daniel, take it away. Great. Thank you, David. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. All right. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to come and tell everybody about uh, the wonderful Sci4 package. Um, and so David asked me to give just a, a brief tour. And uh, David, if you could go to the next slide for the Sci4 overview. Sci is is a quantum chemistry package. Obviously, it focuses on wave function and density functional methods. It focuses on molecules as opposed to to solid state systems, except of course molecular solids. Um, you can calculate energies, geometries, vibrational frequencies, and many other properties with it, including response type properties. Uh, Sci is structured with a highly flexible Python uh, front end that gives the user tremendous control over what happens and a, and a, a highly efficient C++ back end for the computationally intensive components. It is free, fully open source. It's under the LGPL license so that it, uh, it is really available even to use by commercial users um, and other codes. It's faster than most commercial codes, particularly in its density functional capabilities and, and our density fitting capabilities, which you'll hear more about later. It also has a highly modular infrastructure specifically designed to be easily extensible and to interoperate with lots of other codes and lots of other packages. Uh, and it's easy to use, highly automated uh, for expert users and for, for large scale big data type applications. Um, our goals for the Sci4 projects are many, uh, but first and foremost, we wanted to provide free open source software for, for quantum chemistry scientific applications. We wanted the code to be fast, but simultaneously easy to use with a solid level of documentation for both expert and new users. Uh, we wanted it to have a very robust infrastructure that would be allow for very easy and rapid development of new theoretical methods. <clears throat> we also wanted to make the code very friendly to the, the modular uh, aspects of it, reusable libraries, add-ons, plugins, et cetera. Uh, and that, that would promote the development of highly reusable software components. Next slide, please. So a lot of features uh, to Psi. Um, the, the density fitting in, in almost everywhere for very fast computations. Uh, Hartree-Fock, of course, density functional theory with essentially every functional that you could want, and that's through the LibXC package. A uh, wide range of, of miller plesset type perturbation theory and couple electron pair approximations, a uh, couple cluster type methods, as well as couple cluster type methods for excited states, hence the equation of motion prefixes, CAS SCF and RAS SCF through the DET CI code, as well as truncated and full CI and RAS CI also through the DET CI code. Uh, SAPT capabilities, again, thanks to the to the uh, Cheryl group uh, for, for that, those developments, as well as optimized orbital MP2, 2.5, MP3. Um, and uh, density cumulant functional theory. I'm just reading these to you at this point. There's just so many different features to go through here, uh, including relativistic corrections, charge embedding. Uh, we do have a couple cluster linear response. Um, and I also should have had, uh, we're work also working on quadratic response that we hope will be available soon for, and the linear response for frequency dependent properties such as polarizability, optical rotations, uh, Raman optical activity spectra and the like. We have analytic gradients for so many of these methods, uh, including all those density functionals, uh, perturbation theory, and, and couple cluster methods. Uh, and, and MBIS charges and multiples recently, and, and so many components are uh, shared memory paralyzed, parallelized with uh, OpenMP. We also gain a lot of features through external interfaces, right? So interfaces to other packages. So for example, we can take advantage of a lot of the features of C4, uh, we can access a lot of density matrix renormalization group capabilities through the chem PS2 package. Uh, we have access to the D3 corrections of Grima and so on and so forth. I'll just highlight these, uh, particularly the effective fragment potentials through LibAFP, PCM solvent corrections through uh, PCM solver, 
uh, and a great deal more uh, in, on into visualization capabilities, density analysis, uh, using an external interface such as WebMO to build molecules and carry out calculations on your favorite hardware, uh, and access to example for to the uh, ADC type capabilities through the ADCC package. So I, I'll speak very briefly about the, the long history of SCI, uh, which, you know, the myths of time, as David put it on this slide, for, for back in the Berkeley days. I think we could say that the package really started in the, around 1977 in, in Professor Schaefer's group at, at uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, at that time, the code really focused, it was a fully Fortran 77 code, of course, and it really focused on analytic gradient techniques and configuration interaction techniques most heavily. Uh, and then going forward, uh, when the Schaefer group moved in 1987 to the University of Georgia, uh, it, was still, they it was still the same Fortran package, but they decided to rename it Psi. Uh, Berkeley didn't seem like the right name to use at that point after they moved away. But then in 1989, uh, as Unix systems became more and more ubiquitous, Kurt Jansen, who's now at Google, and uh, Ed Seidel, who's, who's I believe at Lawrence Livermore National Labs, they uh, carried out a, a porting and conversion of it to the Unix systems uh, and, and started to introduce uh, a, a mix of C and Fortran code then. Um, and then it was about the time, before I get to the 1999 part, um, I'll just say that David and I became involved with Psy starting in 1991, almost 30 years ago, which I'm amazed to say that it's been that long, when David and I were uh, undergraduate researchers in the Schaefer group for the summer. Uh, that's when we first uh, were introduced to this package. Um, but when we became graduate students and then later as postdocs, we started working on our own sort of overhaul of Psy with the help of a lot of fabulous uh, collaborators and we converted to a C, C++ form and then made it fully open source. Um, and that really, I think, we started getting a lot of more contributions, not just from our own uh, core teams uh, associated with our groups and the, and the group at, at the University of Georgia, but uh, expanding the, the developer base. Uh, and so after 1999, we, we saw a real flurry of activities. Uh, Jet, uh, Justin Turney started working on LibMints, which has been really vital for the rapid expansion of the package and capabilities. And then there were, uh, starting in 2011 to 2012, we, we uh, launched uh, really Sci4 in beta release uh, and started writing papers describing what we were doing, uh, thanks to all the wonderful work by the folks you see here and the core developers that we'll be talking about on the next slide. We went into the 1.0 release of, of Sci4 in July of 2016. Uh, and then not long after that, in the same year, uh, Sci became a true Python module. Uh, and, and so it could be loaded into a pure Python script. And then after that, uh, several different releases and associated manuscripts came out. That's a 1.1 release in May of 2017, and then 1.2 in 2018, 1.3 in 2019, and then very soon we anticipate the 1.4 release uh, to be available. Here are some of the Sci4 uh, core contributors. We, we are really grateful to all these folks who have been working on this over the years. Um, you know, all these people have really written substantial components of the code and really made Sci for what it is today. Uh, and and uh, as I said, we're really thankful for all those contributions. I also mentioned that it's it's open source, but really it's truly open source in that we have a, a fully open development effort. Uh, the package now on GitHub has over 14,000 commits to it, uh, 100 contributors, uh, lots of GitHub stars, which is a nice way to determine, you know, how many people are really paying attention to it. And we follow a proper software engineering process with, with uh, a pull request system, with uh, code review, uh, and automatic checks uh, and testing through continuous integration services. Uh, here are some of the recent papers. There was the WIRES uh, Computational Molecular Science Review uh, that JET first authored. This was uh, came out in 2012 uh, with the 1.0, around the time of the 1.0 release, and it, and it was an ISI highly cited paper. Uh, Rob Parrish uh, authored the 2017 Journal of Chemical Theory and Computation paper that was coincided with the 1.1 release, uh, and it's also very highly cited. And most recently, Daniel Smith was the lead author on the JChem Phys paper uh, just a couple of months ago, uh, and it's already got 18 citations, uh, even though it's only been in print for a very short period of time. Sci has really broad international interest. Uh, as you can see, this, this, these data are not fully 
uh, up to date, but they're still, I think, pretty uh, representative. Uh, downloads really all over the world. Um, we're more popular in Russia than we are in Canada for some reason. We got to work on that, but uh, uh, <laughs> but still, it's a broadly popular and very widely used package that we're all really proud of. Uh, we, I mentioned that we wanted the package to be highly uh, user friendly. Here's a, a, an example of one of the simplest uh, but very useful uh, sci for inputs. Um, this is in what we call the Cython uh, structure. You can, you don't have to necessarily, you can, but you don't have to use Z matrix or Cartesian coordinates to specify a molecule. You can just name it and uh, the package has the capability to run out to PubChem and grab a structure. And then you can subsequently optimize that structure at your favorite level of theory. Again, just a few lines to get started. Um, that's the Cython input. We also have uh, an API for this so that you can treat your input files that will be pure Python uh, syntax. So you can import Sci explicitly as a, as a uh, module, a Python module, uh, and then using the Sci4 prefix, then you can do exactly the same thing. You can have it run out to PubChem and grab benzene and do the same optimization that you saw on the previous. So both of those syntaxes are available. Uh, and, and so because these are really Python code, you have tremendous control and flexibility over the type of workflow that you want Sci to carry out. I'll mention just one thing from, from my group at Virginia Tech. Uh, I, I'd like to talk about what everybody's doing here, but I'm gonna focus on Ben Payton's work uh, on machine learning. He's, got, he's had a couple of projects that he's spearheading, one using uh, ridge regression techniques to train MP2 to yield couple cluster level properties. And more recently, he's been working on neural networks for forecasting real-time couple cluster. So the kernel ridge regression approach is, is in what Ben calls the density tensor representation. And as I said, it allows you to train MP2 to produce couple up, a couple cluster level properties. As you can see on the right-hand side of this image, uh, he, he's plotted out the lithium fluoride bond breaking potential energy surface for that diatomic. Uh, and whereas uh, MP2 is a little bit off and another type of, of ridge regression approach called the T-amplitude tensor representation has some clearly unphysical problems with it. The density tensor representation can have MP2 reproduce a couple cluster level surfaces using only 20 training points for it. So a small number of points and he's able to uh, nail the bond breaking curve. Ben has also been involved in a lot of outreach uh, and, and trying to help people use Sci to understand machine learning techniques. So he's got, uh, for example, several different GitHub repositories that I'll, I'll call out. Um, the machine learning quantum mechanics uh, which is connected to the work that I just described, uses the Python interface with Sci and Scikit-learn, uh, and you can see the link to it in our, in our Crawford Group organization. And then he's generated a wonderful tutorial, Learning Machine Learning, uh, that's a Jupyter Notebook tutorial for beginners, that is newcomers to machine learning, also available. And then as I believe he's gonna talk about that uh, on Saturday in the, as part of the Sci4 Education prog uh, project where he's developed some open source lab exercises. So with that, uh, I'm going to turn it back over to David, who's going to tell you about lots more wonderful things that are going on with Sci. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Daniel. Um, yeah, I'll just spend a few minutes giving a, a big picture overview of some other things that are in Sci4, just uh, so folks are aware if we have some newcomers. Let me um, highlight just a, a few key things. Uh, First off, a, a lot of uh, very important work by Lori and Daniel um, really making a very powerful driver. The driver uh, just means the part of the code that looks at the user input, tries to figure out what the user wants, maps a route through all the algorithms and libraries in Sci4, and kind of drives the computation and calls the right functions in the right order. And um, there's a lot of, that sounds maybe boring at some level, but there's a lot of room to really jazz that up and make it smart and able to do complex things. So for example, uh, they've added the ability to have built in uh, automatic complete basis set extrapolation, focal point approaches, I'll say a little bit about that. Um, Python integration of the driver was really big as Daniel mentioned. And uh, there's a lot going on with interoperability that I won't have time to say much about, but I, I, I will mention that word at least because it's really important for us. Um, complete base set extrapolation, many of you are familiar with the concept that 
is you have these Dunning basis sets. You can go from double to triple to quadruple to five zeta to six zeta to seven zeta. Uh, and um, there are simple formulas like the ones I have here that can tell you how to extrapolate uh, up two or three of those calculations uh, to estimate the complete basis set limit. And this works pretty darn well. And that's all now built into Psi 4. So you can see in this graph the convergence in blue as I go from double to triple quadruple. Um, but um, the little lines at the bottom show you the extrapolations, which are really quite accurate and get you there a lot faster. So that's built into Psi 4. And how do you access that? It's as simple as saying, um, CCPV uh, bracket and then whatever two basis sets you want here in this case it's Q and 5 and it automatically goes off and runs the QZ goes off and runs the 5Z it grabs the correlation energies it pops them into that formula up there it extrapolates them and it just works so there's no work on the behalf, behalf of the user um, focal point approaches this is the name Wes Allen gave this uh, method and he has a couple papers about this in JCP um, other people just call this composite methods. This is pretty popular in quantum chemistry. What you do is you mix and match different uh, methods to estimate a higher quality method. So for example, couple cluster at the complete basis set limit can be estimated by doing MP2 at the complete basis set limit plus some delta CCSD princess T, a couple cluster correction, I like to call it. And what is that correction? It's nothing but the difference between couple cluster and MP2 and some smaller basis. And it turns out that that difference is pretty insensitive to the basis set. So if you can afford that in a double zeta, it's probably pretty close to what it would be in a TZ or QZ basis. And so that's a really good correction then add to the MP2 uh, complete basis set limit, which I can get by extrapolation. And so just to illustrate that, uh, the um, explicit extrapolated five, six couple cluster values, this dashed heavy red line. And we estimate that super well with this focal point approach approximation, which is the uh, dotted red line. And it's just extremely, extremely close. And the cost of that only requires a double zeta couple cluster calculation, not a six zeta couple cluster calculation. So this is super effective. And how do I do that in Psi 4? It's just this line. It's, it's as easy as this. Uh, you just put in the TQ extrapolation for MP2 and you say plus D colon, the D stands for delta, uh, and then what your delta correction is. Um, a lot of people uh, have uh, worked on and added some nice uh, mini body expansion code to Psi 4. Most recently, Daniel Smith and uh, Asim El Nazan. And uh, this does a lot of automated things for many body calculations with clusters where you can break a cluster. Maybe you have 10 water molecules. You can uh, compose that as a bunch of monomer and dimer and trimer calculations and get a really good estimate of the overall interaction energy. It has built-in basis set superposition error corrections. And um, it's all automated. So it knows all these BSSE rules and it's, it's just all baked in. Uh, in fact, you can do not only energies, but gradients as free and frequencies as well, which is quite powerful. Um, we'll hear more this afternoon about what the SAP code is and how to use it. Um, I'll just mention it's a way, if you have a couple of molecules, to compute their intermolecular interaction. And we use that perturbation theory to do that. Um, and uh, Psi 4 has some very powerful capabilities to do this um, that we'll hear more about this afternoon um, in Zach's talk in the uh, tutorial. I will give credit to the people who started off the SAP code. Ed started this off uh, some years ago now and wrote a really nice density fitted SAP code. Then Rob came along and improved and extended that and gave us fragment based SAP and intramolecular SAP. And uh, we've been able to get a really good use out of this code. So for example, in collaboration with Bristol Myers Squibb, we've used this to look at protein ligand interactions. And the fragment based SAP can tell you which contacts between the drug and the protein pocket are the most important ones for binding. And the surprising result of this study was that there were a lot of them. <laughs> you might have thought there's one important contact or two important contacts. 
it turns out in this one, if you wanted to understand substituent effects, it involved bond, uh, peptide bond dipoles all across the protein pocket, which was uh, kind of a surprise. You can run Sci4 and Jupyter notebooks. So if you hang around for the tutorial this afternoon, uh, Roberto Di Remigio will show an example of how to do exactly that. Um, Eugene added some really nice density fitted couple cluster code a while back when he was a postdoc with me, and we make heavy use of this for a lot of our benchmarking and uh, databasing work. Uh, so it's really fabulous. And um, it gives you a lot of speed up if you do the density fitting. So a normal couple cluster calculation for benzene trimer took us eight and a half days. And then with Eugene's uh, tricks and frozen natural orbitals and density fitting, we got it down to two days. So a 4x speed up is pretty important. Um, let me mention uh, Uber Boskaya, um, professor in Turkey, has been very active in adding a lot of analytic gradient techniques, especially to many body perturbation theory, couple cluster theory, and optimized orbital methods, and those are available in Sci4. Uh, Daniel Smith made some really important contributions uh, in something called Sci4 NumPy. If you haven't heard of this, uh, FYI, this is really great. Uh, this leverages Cypher's Python front end to, um, and, and a lot of the powerful Cypher machinery under the hood to implement a lot of um, quantum chemistry methods in a very clean and readable format. Um, and so you have this nice repository of reference implementations. So you can just read the code and see, oh, that's how you implement this method. Uh, a lot of times those reference implementations are actually pretty efficient as well because they're leveraging the software libraries under the hood, but they're very readable because they're using Python and NumPy on top. Uh, and there are nice tutorials there as well where maybe there's not just some code, but actually some explanation of the code and how it works. So this has been really valuable to the community, I think. Um, there are some of the available methods uh, that uh, we have in Cypher NumPy. There is a user forum, so check that out if you weren't aware of that. Um, Cypher Education we'll hear more about in a few minutes, um, so uh, I will leave it to Ashley to tell us more about that. Um, I'm really excited about Cypher's ability to um, generate and manage and uh, deal with a large number of calculations. I think high throughput is becoming a theme in quantum chemistry as machine learning is becoming important. And uh, Daniel just told us about uh, some of his work at Virginia Tech doing some machine learning and leveraging uh, size Python API. We're doing a lot of that at Georgia Tech as well. And I'm sure other people everywhere are using this technology. Um, we'll say more about this in a minute, but um, we've spent a lot of time interfacing uh, sci to the QC Archive project of MULSI, and uh, that, I, I think, has really uh, catapulted us uh, ahead in this area. So let me wrap up and then have a couple minutes for questions. Um, I think um, sci is um, really out of place where it's very usable and powerful for a lot of uh, things. Uh, it is fully open source. It's uh, got a LGPL license. Um, density fitting is in many, many parts of the code and has been a big win for us. Um, the team of developers is uh, great and continues to grow and evolve. And uh, the developers have a developers focus day tomorrow that everyone is welcome to join us in because we'll spend a little time talking about what's going on uh, and uh, how to become a sci developer. Um, Interoperability, super important. Wish I, I could talk for an hour about that, but I won't uh, in the interest of time and the big data sets I just mentioned. 